It's my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to the fourth and final roundtable of this two-day symposium, Hidden Stories, Global History, Local Networks. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to work with such a wonderful team to develop the exhibition currently on view at the Aga Khan Museum, especially exhibition curator, Felicia Kira Phillip, and project manager, Dr. Melissa Morton. I'm also grateful to the participants in the symposium who've been enriching and enlarging our understanding of the objects on display and pointing out new directions that our work might take. In this final roundtable, which will be followed by a closing re uh, reflection by Alexandra Gillespie and discussion, uh, our format will be slightly different. We've decided to have here only three presenters rather than four, and each person will speak for more like about 15 minutes or so. But the main difference is that we'll be centered on one object from the exhibition, not several. I think you'll agree, however, that it's a particularly potent object and one that invites us not only to look backward at the late 18th century past, but also to reflect on our present time and toward possible futures. I'll leave it to our panelists to talk about this book in detail, but I do wanna take just a couple of minutes to comment on its shifting role within our exhibition. As I mentioned briefly in yesterday's opening remarks, our gallery map showing the Silk Roads, both the historical routes of trade and exchange linking East Asia and Europe and the metaphorical Silk Roads, including multiple sea routes in the region, uh, our map extended a bit further to the east, as far as Japan, and to the west, extended as far as the Americas. We did this, as I mentioned, because we wanted to illustrate how binding formats, widely used in the Mediterranean and Iberia, also traveled to the so-called New World. We imagined that we might place this book among other similar volumes in a case showing book binding formats. But at a certain moment last summer, we were brought up short, listening more carefully to what this book was telling us. We had been looking at the book format and thinking less about its contents. This is a baptismal registry listing the names, family members, and neighborhoods of indigenous children in Mexico City. The time we were in made us better able to listen to what the book had already been telling us about colonialism, yes, but also about indigenous communities, families, and survivance. I'll just very briefly introduce our three panelists in the order that they'll speak in the hope that each of them will introduce themselves more fully in a way that seems good to them. We'll begin with David Fernandez, who is rare book librarian at the Thomas Fisher a rare book library at the University of Toronto, which is the current home of this volume. Next, we'll hear from Dominique Polanco, who is professor in the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech University. Our third panelist is Ana Lu Maria Lopez, who is the Ayer Indigenous Studies Librarian at the Newbury Library of Chicago. David, please begin. Um, thank you, everyone. And I want to thank by, I want to begin by thanking the organizers and, and, and co-panelists uh, for this um, wonderful opportunity. Well, you know, Melissa, Susanna, and Maria, we've had uh, very various discussions uh, over the past few months, um, and also Dominique and Analu. Um, about this item in the context of the exhibition. And, and I'm glad we did that because those reflections made me think of the of exhibitions. It's something um, that I do as a rare book librarian at the Fisher Library, um, thinking of exhibitions as sites of encounters um, where um, scholars and students and members of the public and anyone interested can see these items and, 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 and see them as the embodiment of, of culture and, and history. And, and also this exhibition in our conversations prior to this um, uh, presentation today uh, also made me think about the local and the global and, and, and link it to the idea of like something, you know, personal and public which for me is tied to um, this manuscript. Um, you know, so the story of this manuscript is just like that for me. It's, it's in between the personal and, and the public. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself before I move on. Uh, as I said, I'm a rare book librarian at the Fisher Library and I've been a librarian for eight years before that. Um, my background is in Latin American studies and, and I've also done training in, in book history and bibliography with a focus on um, the history of the book and printing in Latin America, and also the history of colonial manuscripts uh, in Latin America. And actually, 
Uh, Dominic and I met uh, many years ago uh, when we were doing a, a paleography uh, fellowship at the Huntington Library, where we spent a lot of time looking at a very similar uh, materials uh, such as this one. So I want to go back to that idea of, of, you know, you know, I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity to talk about this manuscript because it speaks to me both at a very personal level and, and, and also as a professional, which, you know, at the end, they're tied together by a conviction that, you know, we do everything that we have to do in order to preserve and make available the knowledge of the past, and especially in the context of, of manuscripts like this one. Um, so I think that the book in Latin America has experienced many lives over the centuries, some of which are bound uh, to the lives of their creators, owners, and readers. The arrival of the European Codex in the 16th century, along with the technologies of printing and book production disrupted the lives of books that until that point had functioned as living entities and vivid records of the cultures and societies whose lives were also disrupted by the promoters of the new books. The story of the first printed book in this continent, titled Breve y Más Compendiosa Doctrina Cristiana en Lengua Mexicana y Castellana, is tied to the story of the violent disruption of indigenous cultures and knowledge that continues to the, till, until this day. Printed in 1539 by Juan Pablos in Mexico City, the first of thousands of books published by Europeans and the Americans was authored by no other than the first uh, Archbishop of Mexico, Fray Juan de Sumarra, who is known both as the promoter of the introduction of the first printing press to operate in the Americas, but also as the leader of the campaign of destruction of the books and other cultural objects that were created by various cultures, including the Mayan, Aztecs, and Mixtec people of, of uh, the Mesoamerica uh, region. I wanted to start with this um, idea or, or with this idea of like the imposition of the European book over uh, other forms of knowledge in the Americas because as librarians and archivists working with the rich cultural uh, record of this region, we're often confronted by the complex lives of books in Latin America in the context of our work. The book that brings us here together, a baptismal ledger created and maintained between 1768 and 1776 in the parish of San Sebastián Martín in, in Mexico City has experienced many lives. And in the process of sharing its biography, we can learn many things, but one of them is how to uncover the hidden stories that lie beneath um, the surface of its pages. So the acquisition of this manuscript by the Fisher Library in 2014 began a new chapter in the life of this manuscript. From the start, its materiality and content capture the attention of students and scholars in book history and other uh, disciplines. Um, can we change the slide, please? Uh, sorry, it's just stuck. stuck. Okay. So now I want to go over some of the, so you can see some of the material aspects of the item um, before I share some comments on the manuscript as a compelling tool for teaching and learning in the context of my work as a rare book librarian at the Fisher Library. So here you see the organization of the manuscript with alphabetical tabs and, and it's very neatly produced. Uh, all the letters that you see, uh, they seem to be produced um, using a stamp or some sort of stamp, uh, which you know I think is interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see the first page when you know we can see from the beginning how the in the presence of this item from the get go or from the beginning, it's telling us um, 
immersed in us in, in its um, content and in, in, in its you know, goal or what it's supposed to be. So it's a book and libro en que se asientan los bautismos en esta parroquia, a book in which um, the entries or, or entries for the baptisms of indigenous uh, children are recorded. So that's the first page. Can we see the next uh, slide, please? Here we have a typical um, page in the in the manuscript, um, which um, includes, as you can see, many number entries. Uh, and the same number of entries, I think it's 400 and something, uh, are number and exactly the same number of entries uh, are a number. Um, can we go to the next page? Here we have a particular entry. Uh, here it's a case that is number. And then there are formulaic, very much so like a lot of notarial documents produced uh, for various purposes um, where we record, uh, and I'll walk you through it, in La Ciudad de Mexico, first the location, then followed by the date of the baptisms, um, and then I, the vicar, baptize the name of the child, the, the date of birth. Um, in this case, we have an example of a child of unknown parents, uh, the name given to the child, and the names of the godparents. Uh, if you go through the entire manuscript, which is uh, available online through the Fisher website, and I believe also through the exhibition website, you'll see patterns uh, throughout the entry. Some record more information and others uh, fewer information. Can we go to the next slide, please? And so here we have some uh, of the information that may be uh, relevant or useful. Um, so here, 170 number entries followed by 100, uh, four, it's 470 a number entries as well. Um, in the cover, it tells us that it's number 14 or volume 14, which suggests that other uh, similar manuscripts uh, were kept in the same parish uh, for a lengthy of, of time. Next slide, please. So since the arrival of this manuscript at the Fisher Library, it had had all sorts of uses. Um, the first person to study um, its binding was Greta Golick, who was a scholar in book binding. Uh, but also the organizers of this exhibition uh, were one of the first groups to see it and in, in, in put the binding in context as Suzanne mentioned uh, um, not long ago. In 2017, it was included in another exhibition, Flickering of the Flame, a Print in the Reformation, which was curated by B.J. Carefoot as an, and used as an example of the effects of the Reformations in the Americas, particularly in North America. And, and in that context, um, the manuscript was also presented as an example of the casta system, um, uh, but in, in, in a manuscript form. Um, since uh, 2016, the manuscript has been part of a selection of primary sources used by students in the history of colonial Latin America taught in, in the Faculty of History in, in the, at the University of Toronto. So in partnership with Professor Tamara Walker, uh, we've taught hundreds of students using this manuscript and, and, and explore different ways and on how to approach this and, and, and other works from a post-colonial approach. One that aims to uncover the imperial and colonial frameworks and foundations of the idea of Latin America as its surviving primary sources created by Europeans and Criollos in the business of empire and colonial administration. So some of the topics that over the years students have explored in assignments and papers have dealt with idea of conversion to Christianity by indigenous peoples and uh, in, in, in challenging those notions, you know, uh, not looking at this manuscript as evidence that everyone here was a Christian and in, 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 in that their religion uh, 
looking for signs of syncretism and other um, examples of, of uh, indigenous knowledge in, 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 even in a religious um, manuscript or something uh, like this one. Also ideas around colonial society and uh, thinking of family structure, labor, a lot of the professions of the godparents or the parents are listed in this manuscript. Also demographics and um, you know, the manuscript could be a, a good project at some point for like data mining and, 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 and revealing more you know, information about the local history that is tied to this manuscript. And of course, as I mentioned, um, notions of race and, and uh, ideas exploring the caste system uh, as it survive and, and also in books and not just art and other uh, cultural productions from the period. And one of the topics that in, uh, students are quite interested in is this manuscript as an example of, of you know, talk about colonial archives and the and knowledge production in general uh, and with a focus on indigenous knowledge and, and culture. Can we see the next slide, please? So this manuscript has um, prompted us to um, put them together with other items and, 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 and enrich the collection and include other items um, that uh, I like to think they're also speaking to each other in the stacks. So here's an example of a, a manuscript that was acquired a few years after this one to support again, um, research and teaching in this area. And this is another ledger that reports the marriages between uh, Spaniards and, and indigenous people in, in Peru. Can we see the next slide? So here's um, you know, a, a page opening of that manuscript. The structure is a bit different, but the kind of material, the kind of content that is recorded is very similar. Can we see the next slide, please? And, and so I just want to and by showing you one of the ways that students are looking at this manuscript in the context of that workshop I mentioned that we've taught since 2016 for the history of colonial Latin America, where we put in this manuscript in the context of other books produced not only in Latin America, uh, but also in Europe, and try to integrate the existence of this manuscript in the book production, especially the early materials, in, because students see all these items together. So when they're looking at this manuscript, they're thinking of the early religious works that were produced, um, but also indigenous language materials and like artists and grammars and vocabularies um, that uh, are present in the early bibliography of materials produced in Latin America. Uh, but also in the context of colonial administration and regulations, um, including you know, the organization of public and institutional um, entities, church and religious institutions, and of course, educational um, uh, programs. So since then, other manuscripts and printed books have joined the collection to support this educational initiative that aims to teach students how to understand and study the book in Latin America, not only as a tool of European empires, but also as a valuable source for learning new concepts or methods to reveal um, the silent conceptual uh, narratives, as Walter Mignolo tells us, of those who were disqualified as human beings, as historical actors and as capable of thinking and understanding their own history and the making of that history. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Dominique? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. wonderful. Um, thank you, Debbie, that was wonderful. So I wanted to introduce myself first. Um, my name is Dominique Polanco, and I am an art historian and assistant professor in the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech. Um, also, before I kind of jump into my, my interests and everything else, I wanted to acknowledge um, the uninvited land in which I have it in different spaces. Um, first, Virginia Tech is on the land of the Tulum Monica people. Um, 
I'm currently in Chicago, and that is part of um, land that was once part of the Council of the Free um, Fires. And I also want to acknowledge the, the Nahua people of whom I will discuss today in Mexico, proper Mexico City, um, and their descendants, who we'll discuss as well. Um, so my personal research and interest is in um, manuscripts, which is kind of our intersection with David and where we met um, in 16th century. So looking really at um, indigenous kind of um, experiences and persistence and um, resistance through records in a textual sense. Um, I look at the period of um, Spanish invasion and kind of that, that full century afterward. Um, and I focus primarily in central Mexico, which is why this is such a wonderful manuscript to interact with. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so, as I said, I work with manuscripts and part of as being an art historian, I, I like to think about um, materials, but also kind of what, what um, the use of objects are. And that's kind of what we had previously discussed um, as a panel that um, oftentimes as an art historian, sometimes I find these objects in insular spaces, the archive or a museum, and they're really out of context. And one of the things that I was interested in doing kind of activating and understanding the object um, as it was actually used and the, the much, much, much longer history of the practice of baptism in the Christian sense, but prior to Spanish invasion. Um, and so that we can see here that this, uh, this is, um, and I'm gonna cons consistently stress that this is an indigenous, um, a record of indigenous people, of indigenous presence and indigenous kind of cultures that persisted in the now Catholic context in the 18th century. May I have the next slide, please? So um, here is one of um, the, the open folios that we can see. And as we beautifully did, he kind of laid out um, how this manuscript was very likely created. It's a record um, of baptisms. Um, the folios that I have here are in those kind of unnumbered spaces. But as you can see in the columns um, and the margins, excuse me, that the names of each child is listed. Um, next slide, please. And I wanted to do a close up here we can see um, I chose um, a child named Juana Maria. Um, and I looked at kind of what, and the, there is a very um, kind of order to the way that they, these are laid out. It begins with the city of Mexico City um, on the date. In this case, this baptism took place on April 3rd. Um, and it discusses that um, it, in the first person, the text in the voice of the vicario or the victor who does the baptism. Um, and he says that he baptized a child on um, April 3rd, who was born, it was, it was an infant, uh, a girl who was born um, on March 30th, and that the child is of unknown parents, so not named. Um, and basically she comes sort of um, both member of community and begins to be named with this baptism. And he placed this name um, of Juana Maria. And so I noticed a question, which was a wonderful question, um, as we was discussing that there is no mention of prior identity really before. Um, and so thinking of kind of the right, the ritual of baptism, this is that moment where people join a community and that there are many different you know, aspects of this, one of them being kind of the, the water, the bath um, that occurs, but also that this is not the only time in which, especially on the land of Mexico, um, or Tenochtitlan formerly, um, that this ritual of joining the community involved these elements of water, um, and that this is um, kind of what activated my interest in thinking about this rite, but also larger, thinking about naming as a colonial act, very, very intentional colonial act. So I have the next slide, please. And so um, <laughs> the, the highlight are going to a little wonky here, but um, if you see on the map, this is a map um, taken from a wonderful book that I highly recommend all of you read um, by the art historian Barbara Mundy that she has of um, Mexico City, formerly Tenochtitlan, Mexico Tenochtitlan at this kind of transitional moment um, in the 16th century from 1556. And we can see, and we're right, yellow square is supposed to be more to the right, but that's fine, <laughs> um, that the um, former Calpulli or the former kind of Baggios as they kind of become named in Spanish um, neighborhoods um, where Mexica people lived prior to Spanish invasion and continue to live for centuries after um, were 
simply renamed. These are names, and you'll notice they all have saints' names. So in the case in the, the top left is Santa Maria Quipopan. So this is what was once Quipopan has now been kind of baptized as being Santa Maria. They all have saints' names. They all have Spanish saints' names. But on the far right, um, we have San Sebastian Azacuaco, which is the town or the, the neighborhood that was Azacuaco, which was um, a Mexican neighborhood that kind of gets christened, gets baptized as San Sebastian. And this is where on a, that square on the, um, above the name is where we have our parroquia, our, our, our church. And very likely, and it's, it's um, been understood that most of the churches that were established were very likely on top of, literally on top of, as the Spanish like to do, built upon um, the foundation of a temple. So previous Mexica place of worship. Um, and so this is the case. So not only do we have kind of the naming as an act of colonization, as an act of, you know, assertion of ownership, um, but the religious act of both the Christian name and, um, you know, the, the temple being replaced with the church. Um, and so this is kind of taking us to the location from which the baptismal record comes. Um, may I have the next slide, please? And so this is our, our parroquia today. Um, it is located a little bit outside um, the outskirts of um, a small neighborhood called Tepito. Anyone who's been to Mexico City is probably familiar with Tepito. It's a historically famous neighborhood for many reasons. Um, one of which being that it was inhabited by people, um, not only Mexica, but also people who came from outside of Tenochtitlan. They were merchants. They were kind of temporarily housed in this neighborhood. Um, today, it's, it's a vibrant, um, interesting neighborhood, a little bit outside of um, the cathedral region uh, that, that has lots of merchants, street merchants, um, its own kind of community. People have been living there for some reason and, and know that history. Um, and so here we can see our parroquia today. If you can um, continue, please. And so I wanted to um, also show you this wonderful photograph I found from the um, National Archive in Mexico, um, the Anthropology Museum of History that has digitized photographs. And this is, I can't promise that this was the exact fountain, but this gives us an idea of, at least in the 20th century, what the fountain and kind of space may have looked like. Um, and so thinking of this idea of um, water and this rite of baptism, and I thought back to my, you know, more of my um, interest in research being the 16th century. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, and this was thinking about what has been termed by um, scholars as an ablution ceremony. Um, this is a, a rite of passage, um, the earliest one that children after birth <laughs> would do. And this is um, a, a ceremony that would take place in the home. And this is after a child was born and wonderfully so, it was often four days, give or take, depending on kind of many circumstances, but roughly four days after birth. Um, and what this was, was the first bath. And it was a ceremonial experience um, that was led by um, to, to see, see the, um, the religious specialist, the um, kind of medical specialist as well, who is oftentimes later named the, the midwife by Spaniards. Um, what we see here is a folio from a codex that was created, um, was commissioned um, in the early kind of colonial period in 1524 for the Viceroy. And what it is is a collection of, um, of cultural experiences and kind of data, really. Um, it, both on the left, you can see a little bit, there's text and on the right, we have the images and all this was created by um, indigenous hands with indigenous knowledge on European paper and then bound kind of work consumption for Europeans to understand what was happening prior to. Um, so keeping that in context, of course, and what we see is on the, um, the right of the detail, we see that the, um, it says here the patera, but the, the TCC has, taken the child and she's about to do a ritual bath and there was a whole ceremony so as I said this was done in the home the reason for that being that um, the Nawa understanding was that children did not have the heat from the sun yet which was essentially translates to in the colonial period as a soul the tamale, uh, the tamale was not given to them yet so they were really um, kind of precarious and this this anchored this to them their heat um, and also introduced them to the community um, so there was a bath that was performed, and then depending on the sex and the gender of the child, um, they were assigned kind of different professions. So on the top right um, of 
this image at the back, you can see that that would be for a male child and the miniature item would be you know, part of the ceremony for a boy. And this would be uh, bows and arrows, um, other types of weapons, other tools of male profession, um, carpentry, things like this. And on the bottom are tools that would be given and be part of the experience for um, a woman or as a baby child uh, that is a girl um, in her ablution ceremony. And this would be things like um, weaving tools, spindles. Um, we can also see a broom, so kind of um, activities that were domestic in the home. And then after the ceremony, uh, to go back on the um, full folio on the bottom, we can see who was present for the ceremony. This would be the parents, um, grandparents, um, the kind of religious specialists. And during all of this kind of process, um, there was, um, essentially what would be you know prayer and ceremony so people would be speaking about good things for the child's future safety for the child um they chose a name as a community to kind of welcome the child into the community um and then after this process the child um would be the umbilical cord would be buried in either two places depending on the sex for a girl be buried next to the hearth which would always be kept you know heating the home we use for cooking and for heat um, therefore tying the child to the home domestically and then for a boy um, depending on where you know in, in geographically it could be tied uh, buried either in um, near uh, where a war a kind of a war field would be um, a meal is very often a, a cornfield kind of place for sustenance for the community um, but outside of the home is mostly the point um, depending on where these took place also there's records of <clears throat> the um, offerings being given to the heat or the heart in, within the home or fire. So heat, once again, is, is part of this. So I'm talking about the elements. Um, and that was also done by the ritual specialists or later called the Bordera. Um, The next slide, please. And this is another 16th century manuscript that also shows kind of this process that we see being recorded. Um, and you'll notice, once again, it's the women who are bathing the child, who are performing this ritual um, inside the home, of course. And these are kind of the in this case, this is for a male um, child. And so in the bottom, we can see the bows and arrows, the loincloth, the tematli, the, the, the mantle or you know, wrap that they would wear. Um, so once again, assigning them to their, their gender identity with this new identity. Um, next slide, please. So once again, I just kind of wanted to anchor this in, in the reality of um, both erasure that happens in colonialism and these records, as we said, you know, to thinking about not only are we seeing on the paper, right, in the text, um, but also what we're not seeing, right, and so understanding all the context. Um, but one thing I do, you know, as someone who studies, you know, people who are long gone and people who might not be recorded is I want to make very clear, and I think we all do very, very well that um, this is a living community that still exists today, that their, their descendants still live in this area. They still attend this church. I was lucky enough to find these photographs online, um, some of them even from Google only a week ago. So it was really wonderful to see that people are still actively using um, the space um, and that they still, you know, whether it's through colonialism, they've lost some of the, the, the names and some of the language, but they still have this sense of community that was part of the evolution ceremony that gets transferred into the baptismal one. Um, and then the next slide, please. As I said, this is the most recent photographs I was able to find. I was very happy to see. Um, and on the right is a plaque that and those who have been to Mexico City, um, you'll see these around, especially in the Centro, um, that have kind of historical markers and events that occurred. And this mentions that um, the parochio is also dedicated to um, a patron saint, those of epidemics, which I just thought really resonated with the reality of us today. Um, and, you know, thinking of survivance, this is the layers of survivance. We have indigenous people who, um, you know, experienced genocide and still persisted and then their descendants today. And then we all are, you know, experiencing different levels of um, survival as well. And so I wanted to honor them by kind of mentioning this as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominique. That was a wonderful, wonderful anchoring, as you say, of the book in, in its, in its um, place of emergence. Analu, would you go next, please? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first, I wanted to thank the organizers of the panel and also my co-host. Um, I really enjoyed hearing you give more context to, especially to David, what you do there at the Fisher and also 
Dominique, like really anchoring that in community because it's definitely part of um, what I'll be talking about and what I do here at the library with um, the Senate community members and just members that, that travel from these communities to view a lot of the items here at the Newberry. Um, I wanted to start off with a fairly new um, acquisition that we got to the library. I think it, it speaks a lot to these types of like hidden stories that we find within documents. Um, it's by the uh, indigenous artist uh, Cynthia Marisol Lozano. It's called Del Maiz. Um, I posted this on social media and people thought it was an actual porn because it's so, um, so realistically done and beautiful. And then when you open it, there's this fabulous um, uh, two books, actually, she included two two little accordion style books in this. Um, one is on a uh, paper that she created, and then another one she actually did use the porn husk to print on it. So it's really beautiful. So um, I'm going to first start off with kind of like a little context, though, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the library, and then go into a little bit more about the community engagement I do here as part of my, my job as the Indigenous Studies uh, librarian. Um, next slide. So first, um, today I'm joining everyone from Chicago or Chicago or Chicago not um, or Chicago in Miami, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, respectively. Um, this land is and will always be indigenous land. Um, if you, this what you're seeing here is a installation by a friend of mine at the First Nations Garden here in Chicago. It's another um, group that I work with, and they're they're uh, really close friends of mine. Um, but they're doing some fabulous work as far as um, um, native plants, both uh, ecology, ethnobotany, just really fantastic work also within um, the community as far as um, community engagement goes and um, just um, um, uh, indigenous knowledge and, and sharing that here in Chicago. Um, if you can click one more time for me. Uh, here's the Newbury's gland acknowledgement, which I also included along with other resources that I'll share in the chat after this presentation. Um, but for us here at the library, uh, respect for indigenous cultural traditions and practices guides all aspects of library service. Um, uh, so, someone just shared screen, I'll fix it. <laughs> okay. Second. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I wanted to tell you um, a little bit more about myself. We go to the next slide. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm part of the indigenous diaspora here in Chicago. So on one side of my family, we're specifically Chichimeca, uh, Wachichi. Um, my family got here in around the 50s on my mom's side of the family. Um, and I, but I was born and raised here in Chicago. I still reside in the south, what's considered the southwest side of Chicago in um, predominantly um, Mexican, Central American, Indigenous um, area within um, the city. It's called La Vita, our little village. So I still reside there with my family. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and the lens that I do a lot of this work from and that I'm coming from is as a librarian, but I'm also a community member. I'm also a photographer, a writer, and stuff like that. And I do this type of work not only in the institution, but also outside, um, outside of the library. Um, so while my interests um, and my passion lies in, um, or while my interests are very, I, my passion really does uh, lie within intentional community engagement and, um, and um, intentional sustainable relationships with community members that come into the, the library. Um, and I'm also really passionate about indigenous uh, language preservation and revitalizing of languages. Um, um, for example, she was spoken by my, my great grandparents side of the family, but We've long lost that over the years. So I, I, towards the end of this presentation, I mentioned some of the work I'm doing specifically with um, our home state. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So really briefly, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the Newberry Library, it's essentially an independent research library. We were founded in 1887 by a bequest of Walter Newberry, a white settler here in Chicago. Uh, we've been in this building that you see on your left-hand side of the screen since 1893. Um, the Newberry is open to the public, but it's not a public library, so we're unrelated to the Chicago Public Library System. We essentially function um, off of donations um, and an endowment for, for some collections that I'll mention shortly. So we receive no government funding. It essentially functions as a large library of archives and special collections. Um, our collections uh, are rare, rare, rare books, manuscripts, and other materials. 
And although we have 11 core collections, I work closely with the American Indian and Indigenous Studies collection. Um, the library's collection related to Indigenous peoples of the Americas began um, with the collection of a gentleman by the name of Edward E. Ayer, also a white non-Native person here in Illinois. Um, who became fascinated with the histories of Mexico and indigenous people of the Americas while stationed in the southwestern the US Civil War. As one would expect, the collection um, is quite vast. It encompasses material related to and relevant to indigenous people's history and culture from across the Americas. So it's pole to pole, coast to coast, 15th century to present day. Um, and um, it, as I mentioned, it was donated in 1911 by a gentleman by the name of Edward Ayer. Um, Ayer became a lumber magnate. He provided tie, railroad ties that were slowly expanding west um, to, um, to the west. And he, through the sale of road ties and, and lumber, basically, he amassed um, large you know, money and, and uh, started collecting in this area. Um, he was interested not only in books and manuscripts, but also cultural heritage materials. So um, although the, the books and manuscripts came here to the library, the other set of material went over um, um, cultural heritage materials or what we know as artifacts went over to the Field Museum here in Chicago, which he also played a role in founding of the Field Museum. Um, the Ayer Library, um, when it first was donated, it was treated as a separate entity. So it was a library within a library at first. Um, up until the 1960s when it became absorbed into the special collections department. Um, other, we have other related um, collections. So aside from the indigenous studies collection, um, we have, we purchased the um, indigenous language collection of James Pillian, Frank Cutter Deering's collections of captivity narratives and other related Americana. Um, those have been added to the AIR collection. Um, as other, other relevant um, related collections include the Everett Graff Collection of Western Americana and William Greenlee's focuses on uh, Brazil and Portuguese colonial history. So those were in, um, added to um, supplement the air collection here at the Newbury. Um, but I always like to put a context too to that. And I, um, while air was remembered as a generous benefactor to all these various institutions and the, and the philanthropist here in Chicago, um, he also uh, benefited from his privilege as a non-native person. So as one scholar wrote, um, Ayer's wealth and power were built upon his business interests, which were part of the devastating process that separated native people, indigenous people from their land, culture, and history. We can go, okay, so now we're, we're caught up here. Um, now with the donation of Ayer's library, he did stipulate that he always have a librarian or a curator. So the first two Ayer librarians at the Newbury were caught Clara Smith, which was also Ayer's niece, and Ruth Lappin, uh, Lappin Butler. Um, so those were both um, white women that administrated the, the uh, Ayer collection. So prior to the 1970s, we can assume that, um, or it can be inferred that the dominant assumptions related to collect, collecting American Indian Indigenous Studies at the Newbury. And I would probably add that um, other libraries and other archives that were collecting in this scope um, that were most users and staff would be at least non-native that were um, coming into the, these um, spaces. So we flash forward to 1970, um, the founding of the Darcy McNichol Center here at the, at the library um, helped kind of shift and improve this way of thinking at the library. Um, the McNichol was intended to facilitate important functions right related to research and improving scholarship in American Indian and Indigenous studies specifically. But it was also broadly, um, it was also created broadly and built in particular, uh, thinking in particularly about indigenous teachers, scholars, and researchers in mind, and also maybe being able not only to facilitate their work, but creating a space where they can come and meet and discuss these type, type of topics. So as the Indigenous Studies Librarian, my main duties include uh, reference assistance for this grant collection of Indigenous Studies material. Um, in a nutshell, anytime anyone comes and has an inquiry about the materials, um, has a research topic, or if it's a community member that wants to engage with some material, um, I'll host them. Um, and actually right before this panel was hosting a set of high school students that came to visit um, the Popovu and some other materials. Um, and these are just a few examples of uh, groups I've been able to host over the years. I've been here about five years now. 
Um, on what you're seeing on the left is a group of women that came from, um, some of them from here in the States and some from Guatemala who wanted to visit the Popo Vuh that we, the uh, sacred um, um, book of Popo Vuh of the um, Quiche Maya in Guatemala. And they came maybe like in February and then some other, um, other photos that I've taken over the years. Um, so I also wanna add that usually these are done um, with permission. They've asked me to take the photos. Um, some moments I don't document. It can be particularly um, a lot of strong emotions when people are coming into the archives and maybe coming across ancestors, right? That they see within documents or maybe something that brings up um, strong emotions. So I, I never um, cross that line of documenting when I'm not supposed to. So even though the Newberry is open to the public, right? Um, um, I'm always asking myself questions when I'm engaging with the community, right? So some things I ask are, you know, what mechanisms are in place that ensure um, a welcoming atmosphere for community members visiting the library um, or working with materials? Do communities know what is held within our institutions? And if so, how are we, how are we working with uh, communities to connect them with these resources, right? How are, we, um, how are we stewarding these collections? Do we take into account specific indigenous protocols for culturally sensitive materials, stuff like that? If you can go to the next slide. So um, over the years, I've had the honor of welcoming, as I mentioned, as, uh, a lot of um, community members, uh, families, um, scholars, researchers. And at times these interactions do open up potentials to co do collaborative projects. Um, to uncover hidden stories within or, or um, add information, indigenous knowledge and context to these colonial documents in the collection. So one example um, of a collaborative project included in writing an article um, with a Nahua community member by the name of Victorino Torres Nava back in 2019. It was focused on this 18th century Nahua play that you see on your left-hand side. Um, when this item first arrived at the Niebuhr in 2018, the dealer description stated the play chronicles the story of a grandmother who leaves her grandson to watch over their turkeys while um, also telling him, keep an eye on a jar filled with a uh, mysterious liquid, possibly honey, right? Um, she tells her grandson not to drink the liquid and warns him that if he does, he'll become sick. So, um, the description that we that was provided translated a word, a uh, nepi as uh, me to mean honey. Um, upon further um, research with um, Victorino and Abelardo, which I'll mention shortly, um, we came to find that the term used for honey was in fact meaning agua miel or honey water, right, in English. So for those of you who know what the sap is, it comes from the maguey plant. So um, when it's fermented, this agua miel becomes the al alcoholic drink pulque, right? Um, so after the grandmother leaves, her grandson gets very hungry. He, he decides to drink um, the, the, the agua miel or the nekwitetzawa, ne and he becomes drunk. <laughs> so when she returns, the grandmother scolds him, and the play concludes basically with them dancing as they exit. So we also transcribed and translated the article um, into a modern variant of Nahuatl, and um, um, we also included English and um, Spanish. And um, the Nahuatl transcription was actually done by another community member, Nahuatl community member and scholar, Adelardo de la Cruz. Um, and for the published article, we wanted to also prioritize the language. So we included a Nahuatl uh, um, um, translation along with an English one. So um, if you can click once, these are kind of like a blown up of, if you click again, you'll see like the, the term that we were um, looking into. Click one more time. There it is, that one. That's the one that we were looking into and researching. Um, okay, if you can click one more time for me. Um, a, recent, um, a recent collaborative project, project um, we did last year was um, a blog post too that we titled um, the Codex Empoala or Asserting Indigenous Rights. Um, we also collaborated on this, Victorino and I, to provide a trilingual um, 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 translation of the article English, Spanish, and Nahuatl. Um, and then if you click lastly one more time, recently we also um, worked with Victorino's community in Puente Pec, uh, Morelos to donate a facsimile copy of a 16th century 
um, map of Tenochtitlan or, or so-called Mexico City. So that just arrived, I believe it was last week or the week before. So we provided them again with um, uh, trilingual descriptions and also with the facsimile that he will have at his um, autonomous community center, uh, community language uh, facility in Puentepec in his community. Um, so these examples really briefly, right, show that um, what can happen when institutions bring in community members to work on materials. But I would also add that it's not only important for them to be collaborators, but for also institutions and for us to work towards um, finding opportunities where community members can lead as well. Um, if you could do the um, clip one more time. So a uh, current project I've been working on includes connecting in individuals in my home state of San Luis Potosí um, with language materials within the collections. Um, it's been very important for me to over the years, in the last, I'd say, uh, 15, 20 years, um, not only to learn two indigenous, two indigenous languages for the work I do here, but also find and understand my belonging within the community and to get closer to living peoples through the language, um, the languages that are very much alive in the community. And I would say it's part of the, what we call, right, the decolonization process as well. And finally, I'll just end, if you can click on the last slide. Um, I can't go into the details of all these projects, but I'll sh share a set of resources for you all in the chat shortly. Um, back in 2020, we received, uh, we, award we were awarded a grant to begin the process of collaborating um, specifically with Indigenous communities more intentionally than perhaps one could say in the past um, to provide better access to materials, but also build sustainable relationships with Indigenous communities. So, the three communities that we're collaborating with um, currently on this grant, um, it was a two year term, we got an extension and um, this was an implementation grant. So we're actually um, a planning grant where we got awarded um, an implementation grant. Um, but the three communities are the urban indigenous community here in Chicago, the Potawatomi, First County Potawatomi, and then the Santana uh, Pueblo in, um, in New Mexico. Um, and um, next slide, please. And I'll just end with this, uh, a quote that I'm um, really fond of, but um, when relationships are built on a foundation of trust and mutual respect, the resulting collaborative efforts can create beneficial alliances that produce new understandings of indigenous cultural history and more sensitive approaches to stewardship of native heritage by non-native cultural um, institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Analu, that uh, gave us so much to think about. And uh, my head is, is full of responses and ideas. Um, and also, I think there's already some questions that have come in from the chat, and I just want to encourage people to, to add more so we can have a, a good discussion. Um, I'd like to, as we sort of move into the discussion, to invite you to respond to one another. And I thought maybe I could pick up a few threads that I was noticing today, um, both that connect the three contributions that each of you made, but also maybe in some cases are connecting back to earlier conversations um, in this symposium. I was really struck in David's description of the book as having many lives. Um, and for me, that was resonating with some comments that Noam had made yesterday with regard to the life of the um, what's called the Toledo Bible. Um, he was bringing out that even though we call it Toledo after um, the place where we know that it was created. Nonetheless, the life of the book was carried out in, in other locations in North Africa, in the Middle East, and, and the majority of his time was spent not in Iberia. So thinking about the, the object as having this kind of lifetime and connecting that to the people who are connected to the object um, opens up all kinds of possibility. At the same time, we want to bear in mind how different these trajectories are. So um, in that light, I was really struck by the ways in which Dominique was bringing out how we have to, I think she used the words, activate and understand. Uh, activating and understanding were very much part of the whole process. Um, uh, exploring how this book tells us about what's happening when people join a community. They come into the community and connecting that to what lay behind. And here is where I feel a kind of divergence in maybe to some extent in, in what we were discussing in the session on Judaica yesterday um, in the com comments by Noam that I mentioned and some of the, the particular local circumstances we're seeing here. Because when Dominique was showing us the Codex Mendoza, she put it so beautifully saying, we see the product of indigenous hands sharing indigenous knowledge on European paper for European readers. So the, the, the local conditions of that um, 
that intersection of knowledge and hands and readers and paper, I, I feel like that would be something really productive to think about. And then finally, um, I love the way that Anilu brought out in, in a, a way that was grounded on the Newberry and on the specific location of the Newberry, but also in ways that can be extended, what institutions can do. And this is also something that David was talking about, I thought really eloquently in thinking in ethical terms and self-reflective terms and intentional terms about what he, what his obligations are and what his considerations are from the vantage point of his tasks at the Fisher. And Anna Lou was unpacking this in a, in a really rich way in terms of her own situatedness, her own work, her own passions, and the connections um, that come as a result of the land that the Newbury is on, but also as a result of the objects that are in the Newbury's stewardship at present. So, so much was opened up there. Um, uh, I, I was also very much struck when Anna Lou was talking about um, uh, people visiting objects, and you mentioned the Popol Vuh in particular, but other, I'm sure there are other texts that also um, bring out, uh, objects that bring out this kind of response. You mentioned their emotions at encountering, I think you said, their ancestors in the documents, and there's a great deal to say about that in itself, in, again, in a local specific kind of way, but it also recalled for me some of the conversations we were having yesterday in the session on South and Southeast Asia, when, I, if I remember correctly, um, two of the contributors were talking about the way in the Tantra of the Five Protectresses, um, the, uh, the goddesses are, are present. And, and there, was, there, was, um, there was some beginning to, to really unpack what that meant to have that kind of presence, like how the book participates in, I, I feel the inadequacy of this language as I use it, how the book participates in ritual. Like it's also anthropology language. I mean, I don't think it's very good language, but. But, but there's a great deal going on there in terms of the book's activity um, and participation and membership um, in a web of relationships. Um, so I'll stop there. Sorry, that was probably more than I really should have. But, but, but those were some of the things that um, I, I was struck by when, when each of you was speaking. I don't know if some you might have questions for one another or themes you'd like to draw out. And I'll stop sharing so we can see people's faces. Well, um, one of the points, the wonderful point, thank you, Suzanne, it's a great um, takeaways and the threads um, that piqued my interest, I guess, for my own research is um, this idea of naming in terms of manuscripts, too. Um, that's really like at the heart of some of my research, just thinking about the colonial names and then later institutional names. In the case of the manuscript that I study, specifically, it is attributed and, and even today in scholarship to being um, the last name of the Duke in Spain, who his collection it was found in, um, even though it was this colonial object. Um, so yeah, it's it's I think that's why I think the naming became so interesting to me as a baptismal naming, um, as you know that layer of colonialism that happens in locations and to people um, to both assert ownership and also to erase, right? Um, and I think that that is one thing I, I'm grappling with with these manuscripts and even calling them codices. You know, some of them were meant to be bound and to be this European format. Many of them were not. Many of them in the manuscript I study um, most closely is just a collection of papers that was bound together later um, and begins called the codex. So I think, um, and that's why I'm interested in thinking about how librarians deal with these things, how they um, can you rename something, you know, is it, I know that there are um, you know, scholars, a handful are working with indigenous communities, renaming them into the communities indigenous names, um, letting them rename them, let alone, you know, then like uh, repatriation, things like this, but, uh, you know, the layers and then now getting to know more um, librarians, thinking about how they grapple with that and where you can kind of do inroads and change within that. Yeah, I, I'm glad you bring that up because the idea of naming, um, it's, it's part of the entire process of organization and classifying not only knowledge, but in the case of what we're talking today, real people, real people that um, existed, had lives, and that those lives, as I mentioned, are in some ways um, captured in, in these books. 
in, in a baptismal ledger like this. So naming um, a child in a, a, as part of a, a religious process that we can only see um, as we go through the entries in this manuscript makes me think of, as you mentioned, in, you know, naming as part of the erasure of one's identity, um, uh, naming as the imposition of one's language over others, and naming as part of, you know, organizing um, every aspect of, of people's lives, including religion, including you know, ideologies, and race. Uh, someone had a question about uh, why we could think of this manuscript as, as something that's tied to the so-called caste system. Um, and it is because race was also a concern in, in, in an, a concept that shaped uh, the production of works on paper, um, including manuscript like this one and the other one I showed where specifically, you know, the vicars or the responsibles for creating these works had to, uh, or requi were required to divide people according to their perception of race. And, and it's not only in manuscripts and printed books, but we have examples of engravings uh, that were printed in Europe um, that also provided in this case, a visual narrative of those um, ideas and perceptions of race. And I'll just add that um, the idea of naming is something that I think about quite often because even when, um, that's my responsibility, right? Interacting with visitors that are coming in, giving them orientations on how do you find stuff, right? Within the library and using the cataloging systems that we have in place, right? And then having to describe and own up, really own why it's a problematic subject heading that you have to look for yourself with this name that you do not refer to yourself as, right? And having to really walk people through this and explain the, the, that layer of colonialism and why these systems are in place, right? And how we're trying to remedy that, right? And um, I know a challenge for us here at the library is um, with, this, with, with this grant, I wanna add that the grant is um, not only the work that, that I'm, I'm part of, there's a whole set of of us here on staff that are working with this. Um, the, the director of the Darcy McNichol Center, uh, Dr. Rose Myron, um, people in catal our catalogers. It's also, um, I'm part of what we call here the Reader Services Department, so Library Collection Services, where we're the ones that are um, um, working with the, the public. Um, so one challenge that we've had is specifically working with the San Ana Pueblo down in New Mexico is finding relevant material that is gonna be about the community because of a subject heading that is so broad. So a subject heading is broad as far as, um, these are standards that are created right by Library of Congress. And it says Pueblo Indians or Pueblo people, right? Um, it doesn't, and we know the Pueblos are very diverse. There's different Pueblos. So it's very um, challenging to find material sometimes that's relevant to the community. And we have to really dig through there and find them. And one thing that we hope to re remedy is start adding, and we've, been doing some pilot programs where the pilot projects, I should say, where we're adding local subject headings, we're adding um, other, um, um, our catalogers are amazing. They've been working towards also adding um, um, statements, right, when we're owning and recognizing problematic terminologies that are used um, historically within some of these manuscripts. So I think about that quite often in the work I do. Um, and just libraries in general and, and what we've inherited, <laughs> so. Me as well, and that's one of the main point of interest in, in, in workshops um, that we continue to do and that I've organized um, not only for that class that I mentioned, but for other um, courses that come in to explore colonial history in different ways. And one of the conversations always lead us to the role of libraries, archives, and, and the way we have been organized in the past and how we're trying to move away. And well, not trying, but really, you know, doing the work to um, re-describe uh, these materials and present them. I keep going back to the classroom because for me is one of the most, um, effective spaces for students to encounter uh, these issues 
in a tangible way, when they have that object, object in front of them and they're not just thinking of history as, as a theory, but as something that continues to live on in, in, in books that are demanding our attention and work in different ways. And like you said, this is one of them, thinking of how to present them to our users um, in a dignified way. I'm struck by how um, uh, all of you are talking about the ways in which um, like there's the book as object, but it's always connected to people, whether it's in the historical past or whether it's in the present day and also extending into the future. And again, this is distinct from, but resonates with some of the comments that were being made in the discussion of, in the round table earlier today on Ethiopian manuscripts or Horn of Africa manuscripts. Um, and there too, this, uh, I remember struck by Tim Perry saying, yeah, um, you know, when, when those books first started to appear, they were getting used in classrooms, which is as like as as sewn objects, right, just to demonstrate a current, certain kind of book structure. But over time, um, that that ground has shifted with um, the teaching of Giz language at the University of Toronto and students and classroom activity um, being positioned in a way to kind of unpack that, um, both in sort of academic settings um, uh, that draw on particular research expertise areas, but also increasingly in connection with the community. Um, and um, again, dis different local conditions, but that move of, of activating the book seems to me really harmonious. And I was just really struck by that. Um, I don't know if any of you have comments for any more for one another. Otherwise, I'll start opening up a little bit to some of the comments that have been coming in in the chat. A couple of them have started um, to be uh, enter into our conversation kind of organically. Um, Elena Sony had asked questions about naming again, about whether there were any indigenous names of the children mentioned or only the European names, um, and asking a kind of uh, sister question almost, when did the names of the neighborhoods in Mexico City revert to their indigenous originals? In other words, naming of individuals, naming of neighborhoods, um, really unpacking a little bit more maybe of what's going on, sorry, bad cat, um, going on in that dynamic. Um, and um, that maybe we want to reflect on that a little bit. And also sort of, um, uh, again, coming back to the Codex Mendoza, where we were seeing the ablution ceremony that is such, I don't know what to call it, such a moving counterpart, such a moving part of the story uh, of baptism, baptismal practice and the baptismal registry that we have before us. Um, you, uh, uh, one of the comments, com people commenting was really struck by the ways in which the woodcut images that you showed immediately after the Codex Mendoza, Dominique, um, how they were in an, yet another register using kind of European design conventions to show um, a related or similar scene. I don't know if that's something um, uh, you would like to comment on, Dominique, or any of you about this, the, uh, the naming partly, but also more broadly, this, this um, colonial encounter, um, which seems iterative and, uh, how can I put it, hard to pin down where one begins and one starts. Um, regarding the formatting of the, the polios, um, I, there's, there's a huge and um, currently underway research um, initiative that's happening at the Getty um, Research Institute on the Florentine Codex, which is a manuscript that, that's why I wrote it's digitized, you can now get through the Library of Congress through a digitization um, initiative, but also um, is physically in Florence. Um, and this was, it's a unique manuscript in many ways. It was um, commissioned and sort of under the, the direction of a friar um, who is often considered the author, but it's not, I will say. Um, um, friar Saigon, um, uh, Bernardino Saigon, and he um, basically led these surveys and sent people out and had this kind of ethnographic type format where he asked people information um, and they they gave it. And so this is this occurred during um, several decades after Spanish invasion. And so that's one thing I kind of tried to plant as well, this idea that this is in the context of, at the best, the informants might have been um, children at the time of Spanish invasion, but the reality was that they've been already living during um, kind of a Christianized experience with Spanish, you know, uh, language, all these other things. Um, and in the case of some of these ceremonies, even um, these informants might not have been from Mexico City proper, 
um, then there are some cases where it's, you know, men speaking about female health, things like this. So it's all these things. And then always under the lens and through the lens of Christianity, right? Because the friar is the one who in the end writes um, the Nahuatl in Spanish. So that those columns and the kind of illustrations, all of this is in, uh, it's intentionally into the encyclopedic genre. And it's formatted such that it's it's categorized into different books, um, topics like um, natural, uh, the people, and that talks about professions. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other names off the top of my head. They'll talk about kind of parts of nature, literally stones and um, the artisanal works, things like this. But that kind of category, which is very European, literally Western tradition, um, European classic Western tradition. So in every way is not indigenous in that sense. And so though the information is rich and it comes from indigenous people and it, for an art historian is some of the richest and sometimes the only source I have to explain other things that are in other um, sources um, or even practices today. Um, I think it's really important to understand that lens. Um, the Mendoza is, I, I enjoy it because it's earlier, but also this idea that format of the blank space, which a lot of um, Mesoamerican manuscripts had, and that's one that's a no-no for Europeans. It really made, especially Renaissance art, you know, artists just so uncomfortable to not have a landscape. And so that was one thing um, that we see a lot more in the Florentine Codex is this incorporation because the artists, this, um, it's like we locally, the artist scribes who are creating the images were looking to prints. And I love um, Suzanne, it's not a print, it's actually a hand-drawn image. It just is mimicking prints. It's intentional to look at that because that's what they're seeing and that's what they're being trained in. Um, and so we see this, and this is what a lot of art historians are able to do is kind of see the, the places where they're using indigenous pigments. There's a wonderful research that's been done um, by Deanna Magaloni, who's now at the Lackland Museum, and she is a, was trained to be a conservative. So she actually had a lab. It's kind of everyone's dream. She had a lab, and, and they both analyzed the, the pigments as well as um, literally recreated the process of making them, which some of these take months to years to process correctly. Um, and then tie that back in her research to Mesoamerican um, cosmovision and concepts of the earth and the clay that's been used and the religious significance and cultural significance of why you would use a particular clay to paint the moon versus another, even though it might be the same color. Um, and this persists obviously into the, into the 70s, uh, 1670s. So um, whereas in the Mendoza, we have you know kind of more of this blank space and um, the different folios were one pages all text and then the images kind of retell and then later we also have the clip uh, the excuse me glosses where we have Spanish it's a mix of Spanish and not explaining and labeling um so some of that blank spaces for that as well um and for me that's that's why I'm so excited to talk about that's what I look at is thinking about how um I think that there's this popular narrative that there is complete erasure and complete appropriation and it is not true. I think anyone who is of Latin American descent and lives in another place today, which you know, a lot of us do, um, understand that adaptation is human nature, right? And I think that this whole symposium shows us this. It's human nature is to be creative, is to understand, to be excited, and to reuse and reuse and, and rethink constantly. Um, and so some of these manuscripts that have been titled as European style or indigenous style is so complicated and thinking even about race, right, this concept of labeling, right, like all of this, there's the castas, which are mostly for European consumption, and then there's the lived reality, where even today in the streets of Mexico City, there's so much happening, and this was a bustling location prior to Spanish invasion, and all the way until today, um, you know, metropolis, really, and so I think that that you know, I'm thinking of activating, but, um, you know, the, these manuscripts are not created in vacuums either, and so people were, you know, speaking indigenous languages, um, losing indigenous languages on purpose, learning Latin on purpose, learning textual versions of an oral tradition, all these things at the same time, um, and, you know, much as we all are, right, I, I grew up in an age where, you know, texting was not the same as it is today, <laughs> um, with my students, I'm constantly saying, you know, what an encyclopedia is, and, you know, Wikipedia is a version of another one, so this kind of adaptation that we're constantly doing is, I think a very good touch point, you know, thinking about teaching these ideas, a really good touch point that dates me with my students, but also I think is a good way to think about, um, you know, we all are doing these things constantly. Uh, but yeah, these manuscripts, just that, you know, 40, 50 year window of time shows us this. And also agendas, right? That there's um, a really more of a religious than kind of a um, governmental survey, sort of one with the Mendoza. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for that, Dominique. It opened up, I think, uh, such an interesting framework for approaching one of the questions that I saw in the chat, which I looked at at first and I was like, this is an impossible question to answer, so I'm not even <laughs> going to ask it. But, but, you, but the way you've been framing this particular local set of circumstances makes me think that might be some interesting things come of it. Um, so it said, loved all the talks. Um, I have some questions. How could we decolonize the archive or the museum? Can some of you talk about how we indigenize the archive or the museum? And of course, you've been talking about exactly, each one of you has been talking about exactly this all along. But what I'm thinking about is, how can I put it? When we indigenize, to use the questionnaire's phrase, um, that might mean a particular thing if we're talking about um, materials that come from or reflect the lived experience of indigenous people of the Americas. But as we've heard in the other sessions, this question of connecting to communities, um, decolonizing understood perhaps in a very broad sense that might involve actual repatriation of materials, might involve changes around access. This is important for other communities as well. So I wonder if any of you would be interested in commenting on that and thinking, especially of Anna Lu's work, but any of you might want to comment on this, um, this wider question, like to what extent can institutions, like can you decolonize, if we can use that word, the museum even at all? I mean, if it's so fundamentally a colonial product, the colonial archive too. Um, uh, what you've, you've been talking so beautifully about what this means for your own particular research area, but I wonder if these are methods and ways of proceeding and particularly the relationship building part of it is something that's important for work that's happening on almost any any aspect of the work that we've been talking about over the last two days. Any of us who are interested in the past, I guess I would say, or, or the book maybe. I think I think about that a lot too in the work I do. And um, um, another, I, I think it's, it came right shortly after this one question. Um, they, um, they made a comment saying that um, we, instead of also, um, I forget how they phrase it, see if I scroll up. They said institutions may want to rethink their outreach programs and, and move away from teaching and instead listening and learning, and which is something that thank you, um, I can't, Elena, for saying that because that's also something that I think a lot of institutions um, need to work on, <laughs> um, especially when they're when they're bringing in collaborators or even bringing in indigenous working with indigenous communities. Um, is listening more to what the community is telling you to do, right? And what 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 um they're looking for in forms of um, relationship building, and that's definitely something that um you know the the Newbury is done in many levels, right? We can say that even back in I don't know, like the 1940s um or so, like they've they've always wanted um Ayer always wanted the collection um to be accessed by people, but I'm not sure if he forethought of how how much it would be used by indigenous people and should be right um, now in recent in recent decades and years. Um, so when I think about access and how um, this kind of ties into another comment that someone made about like technology too, um, like what do we do for like communities that maybe are more rural that don't have access to technology, right? Um, how can we um, work with these communities so they can get access to materials, right? And it comes into another thread, right? That comes out of that is if there's material on um, the idea of repatriating material, right? Should, if we're working, I'll give you an example. We've um, created um, in, back in 2016 an access to culturally sensitive indigenous materials. Um, and then we uh, updated that last year. So we have a new version of it online. But back in 2016, when it was um, adapted here at the Newbury, it still wasn't. Um, it still wasn't uh, approved by the Society of American Archivists and all of these leading institutions, right? So a lot of institutions were kind of like they could adapt, they could adopt this into their into their handling of materials. It was really up to the institution. But the New the Newbury was had started that in 2016 and chose to. And the this this um, protocols of Native American materials that came out um, in 2006, I want to say. Um, was was a set of protocols that was suggested for non-tribal um, institutions and how do they handle culturally sensitive materials and there were a set of protocols and suggestions that to, to be made so it was really up to the institution um, to adopt these or not right so it wasn't until i want to say 2018 that they were adopted right and um, the indigenous librarians and our archivists pushed for them to be adopted here 
and they were turned down. You can find a resource page on SAA and they'll say like the minutes and why people weren't adopting them at the time. And they, they there's one statement that they made that flat out said it's because of white supremacy. That's what we're, what, where it happened, right? This idea of ownership, the idea of we know better or institutions know better than the community. Um, so now you're seeing a lot of institutions integrating this and, and within one of those policies of our updates, it also includes, you know, that we'll work more intentionally, right, with tribal communities, with uh, TIPOs and stuff like that, tribal historic preservation offices. And we've asked ourselves the same thing, like if something's restricted and shouldn't, you know, should we even have it if it's, if we have to have restrictions on it, right? So those are questions that are important that, that I'm glad that we're having here. David, I wonder if you've been thinking about that from the Fisher's perspective. Yeah, and, and also, but also from a personal perspective, uh, because this work, I, I want to go back to that idea, you know, I kept talking about books as living entities, because that has been one of the ways that for me, I've been able to make connections. And, and, and that is, uh, I think, at the core of any decolonizing or decolonial approach. Uh, to work in, in an academic institution uh, that has its own legacy uh, linked to capitalism, colonialism. And, and so by making and learning to make those connections uh, is where um, the teaching happens in a different way. And I wanted to point out that comment that someone made that moving away from teaching, well, I think teaching uh, is how you make those connections and teaching um, at least in my approach from a constructivist um, approach, I'm thinking of, of even uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed that has that influence, you know, so many thinkers in Latin America, uh, where you allow those connections to happen organically, where students, faculty, and other members of the community coming in, either in coming in like in exhibitions or in different outreach programs that we can create, have a voice and have an opportunity to interact one-on-one -on -one with these materials on their own terms, right? And that is teaching, right? Uh, putting um, the lessons of, you know, post-colonial theory that, you know, it's not a new discipline and it has shown us, um, uh, ways to understand and uncover the imperial and colonial foundation of, let's say, the idea of Latin America, uh, but it also shown us its failures uh, to um, be able to, to make this connection. So all I'm saying is, um, it's uh, again, it's all about um, making those connections, but placing an emphasis on, on those interactions between the objects and the peoples from various communities, you know, and I'm thinking also of the work, um, you know, that I've been doing with uh, 2S uh, LGBTQ uh, members that have been able to encounter their own stories and histories reflected in the collections. Uh, collections that for many institutions were not a priority until very recent history. I'm talking about the 1960s. Uh, but by putting peoples and books uh, in one space, in, in like Dominique said, activating their lives, you know, bringing them back to life, at least for that moment, um, you know, the possibilities are endless. In special collections, libraries, uh, not only have an opportunity here to do this kind of work, but a responsibility. Yeah, that's really well said, David, uh, about that responsibility, that set of obligations that's on the institutions, but on individuals as well. Really moved by that. Um, I noticed some of the other um, comments and questions do interesting things in sort of working out from the, the book, I want to return to the baptismal register again, that's at the center of our conversation, thinking about what the digital makes possible and what is possible when we think about materiality in a, in a rich way. And, and we've unpacked a little bit of that, but I feel like there's more to be said. Um, one question was, um, 
what kind of scholarship might be done with this manuscript in the future? Perhaps David could talk about digitizing the manuscript or the pos any of you might talk about the possibilities for scholarship and for other kinds of connection that the digital edition opens up. And, and I'm thinking especially of the community that continues to exist who might be the descendants or at least the members of the same community um, that those um, children listed in the register um, come from. And so that's the sort of digital side, but on the materiality side, there have been a few different questions that, that ask about this. Um, one, um, a few people asking about the, um, uh, the blank book, um, was the, where, where was the book bound? What's the role of the European paper maker or binder? Um, was the book bound in Spain or in Mexico? Were there prohibitions on binding? Um, watermarks, non-invasive testing of the leather. That is, as an object, what, what stories does it have there? So, so the, the immaterial digital on the one hand and the very, very, very material book. Um, and I know, David, you know this book better than anyone, but, but I'm, uh, the others, I, I think, also will have um, things to say about that whole question of materiality and the digital. I'll just quickly... Maybe. So, yeah, sir, yeah okay. so if, if we start with you, W, that would be perfect. I'll just quickly say that, you know, again, this since the arrival of this book at the Fisher in 2014, it has had, you know, a lengthy experience and, and various scholars have looked at it from different perspectives. But until now, um, the digital version um, has been accessed by thousands of people. But again, that connection is not there. I'm not aware of, of projects uh, besides um, this exhibition that have taken advantage of that digital surrogate um, to give it another life. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the classroom, as I've mentioned, the materiality has been used to link that manuscript production to other objects produced in Latin America or in Europe about Latin America in order to see the book not only as a tool of the empire, but like I said during my presentation, as something that we can use to question history um, in different ways and from different perspectives. I'm curious that when I first saw it, um, it reminded me of, um, so another collection, right, that we have here is our genealogy and local history. And I think about people that come in and um, I usually, um, we, we get cross-trained on these different collections. So uh, sometimes I help people that are Spanish speakers only that are doing their genealogy research, get them set up for their genealogy, show them the resources and what's what's available to them, you know, on ancestry, family search, full three, all of these, all of these um, genealogy resources. And when I first saw the baptismal record, I was like, oh, I wonder, is this on any of those? Do people, has that, do you know that if that's available on like ancestry or something, do people go to it to, because I've seen people on these forums, they've definitely helped um, when I'm I'm um, connecting people with resources that they're like, oh, I'm looking for an ancestor or something. And there's some people that go way back, like to the 16th century, that they're able to trace their, you know, their descendants all the way back there. And I've often wondered that about documents like this. That's immediately where my mind went to. And hopefully that that'll be mm -hmm. one of the uses. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, this is brings uh, just uh, parenthetically one of the questions that was asked in, in the in the chat, and I was actually very moved by was I think it was Maria had asked, um, do, do these children whose parents were unknown take the last name of the godparents? And of course, that raised that larger question, which has been in my mind for months and months and months. How do we understand these godparents? Are these people who are already close to the family in some way? Are these community members? Are these people who are totally benevolent and generous? Or are these people who are benefiting in some way from that? And that's a question that comes from my ignorance. But um, it really opens up um, the, the power and the resonance of what you were bringing out, Anavu, that this is not just the material that's interesting to scholars. This, this would be wonderful for it to be available in a way that people can connect to um, uh, on that personal level. Yeah, I really like how you put it, David, about like these these documents being living too, because a lot of people that visit um, too often refer to them, right? Their relatives as well, like our, our relatives, our ancestors are in within these documents um, for, and not only for the Latin American material, but like when we're working with people here in the States too, they're, they say like our, our knowledges are here, right? So it's very much about that connection that can be made and I, I love, I just really, going back to what you said, I, I, I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> because 
I feel like like um, the high school class that I hosted earlier, I like having to have those opportunities where you can bring the material to um, certain groups um, like high school students. And it's a, a very, it's a very special moment where um, it's different in a special collections classroom versus like, let's say at a, at a public school or something, right? Where there, there's a different type of teaching method that we can um, uh, more critically analyze these types of bring up these questions and these materials, which I really enjoy too, uh, about the work that, that we do. I was thinking also about, um, not just for teaching and access, which I think is what allows the digitization, you know, globally, globally right? I was able to find this and transcribe it from, from the US, right? Um, and I think probably the next stage would, would be, and obviously this is like a grant and a launch project and not just one person would need to do it. I'm sure he, he would love to do this, but this would be a lot of work, but probably the transcription would be the next stage in terms of accessibility. And I think, um, and then translation into several languages, like all of this I think is, um, allows for some of these manuscripts and also, you know, the ones I showed allows for these manuscripts to be, become most popular and well-known because they're, um, the Codex Mendoza was, it, it's a whole digital experience. I can, I'll try to find the link and send it before um, my panel, end, this panel ends, but um, there's um, Ina, the Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico um, did, helped fund and was part of this huge initiative that's digitization where you can scroll over and, and see translations and interact with some of the information that was also informed by a larger, really elaborate facsimile. So, um, and there's only a handful of these that this happens to because honestly, in my opinion, is they're just really aesthetically pleasing. They're really, um, you know, there's a lot of historical research on them. So it makes it accessible and, you know, um, people are more interested in, and these are kind of the, the everyday quotidian objects, right? Um, and I think, you know, as someone who does research the 16th century, I, 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 there's so many dead bro, you know, that I can't go beyond a first name. I can't go beyond, um, you know, a legal case and then realizing that that land never came to that person and that's kind of it. Um, you know, the initiation and how it gets written to the history. Um, and I don't think it's unique to the 16th century. Um, in fact, you know, the 18th century. And that was one thing um, when I did closer looks at these um, children is realizing some of them, we have lots of information, the full name. Um, I did notice the ones that were, the parents were known and um, there is more information it tends to be that everyone is part of the church. So I think this is a very like Christian or Catholic way of thinking of, you know, that they're in good standing. Mm -hmm. And so we know them. And it says, even at the end of all of these um, who paid the fees. So, so there's that reality of, you know, being part of the godparent is also paying the fees for the baptism. Um, and so the transactional experience that happens um, and, you know, last names are so, that's its own research in so many ways. We're coming from Iberia and the number of last names um, is that ethnic identification, right? Um, which naming a child in um, a Spanish Christian name, is that erasure that happens? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that is a good step in the way. And I, you know, I think the genealogy I've been able to do, the, the roadblocks I've come across in, in my family's heritage in uh, Mexico and Michoacan, it really is the most vibrant once people come to the U.S., right, in some cities. Um, but it doesn't, and then, then it's church records, really, before that. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, cross-listing this and having this as a reference, um, having more information probably about the family and then approaching this is probably the, the best way that can happen. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think this also shows kind of the power of the book and erasure, you know, because of um, what it's only someone mentioned the tip of the iceberg, right? And thinking about materials, but also the information that we have on here is there's so much more that needs to, um, can be researched. And, you know, I'm thinking about the conversation before that I was just loving and nodding and glad that it's happening in terms of those who uh, have the power in the, in the libraries. Um, I think that that's also the responsibility of scholars is not only, you know, is this for tenure and is this for promotion and is this for, you know, the feather in my cap, but also to think of how can my research improve a community's sense of their identity or um, maybe translate into a language that they can read it too, or maybe not only be writing to the academic world, um, not only be you know hung up on sort of the tedium of um, what academics want to hear in this you know, insular um, way, but thinking globally. And that's one thing that I personally take really um, 
into account when I'm thinking of, you know, images and things like that. that the colonial reality is there's violence, the layers of violence in this, right? And so to be flippant about that or to not have a footnote to follow up or anything like that is um, something I take into account when I'm writing, right? And to who I would like, I want my family to be able to read it just as much as, you know, my colleagues. So um, yeah, and I think just to put my, my two cents in terms of the, the scholars' responsibility, because we aren't, we aren't off the hook, even if not a lot of people outside of our field read, read our work. <laughs> I wonder if I just add two things to, to, to what, some of what you said, Dominique. One is I'm so struck by some of the remarks you're making about um, uh, the, the book as containing genealogies, but also so, so much more. So it's, it's not just the parents' names where those are known, but godparents' names, neighborhoods that these children came from, sometimes even the line of work that the father was in. So there, if I remember correctly, Dominique, there were quite a number of bakeries. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there's like this this richness to the in, to the knowledge that's in this um, book that could perhaps be helpful in unexpected kind of ways. Let's say, for example, there's somebody who's lear learning about their family, but they and they've got the neighborhood, but they're missing some other piece of information. Like so, I, I guess I'm saying that it, it's not just genealogy; it's a whole web. It's a whole way of being situated in in that community that, that that book is encapsulating. And I'm struck too by something I noticed sort of for the first time today. I know I'd seen it before, but it only really entered my consciousness today. I think it was David was saying, the book is numbered number 14. Uh, I don't remember who it was, um, David or Dominique, one of you mentioned that. And I was like, yeah, there's all these books before and after that we don't have mm -hmm. or, or that are elsewhere. Or, or that don't yeah. survive. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, because doing the provenance research, I, there were no other examples like this um, that I could find except for, you know, the examples that survive at the National Library of Mexico. And yet they don't seem to be, um, I don't want to say the same, but, um, you know, so what happened here? Um, yeah. It just magnifies, I feel, the, the sense of, I don't know, kind of awe at the survival of this, this, this yeah. one yeah. book, which... Um, tells us the stories, right? Has these stories of these individual people and these families inside the book, and also the promise of all those other ones that we don't right now have access to, and maybe helps us to look for them and and get somewhere with them. What you know, you mentioned? Oh, oh, sorry. No, no. I was going to say, Rena, you mentioned that there's also like bakeries named and other 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 things. It reminded me reminded me of a mapping project, right? Like overlaying like present day, and we've seen this happen in different examples of. Um, um, Mexico City, right, adding like an overlay of what it would have looked like before, or where would these bakeries be, right, and then overlaying into like a digital humanities project, right, and mapping these areas. So that's just what I thought of. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm also thinking about um, a point that, that um, each of you has talked about in your own way, but Dominique most recently was evoking, that is when we make the effort to work with Indigenous communities, there's many, many, many kinds of challenges, those of us in the universities, right, uh, or cultural heritage institutions make that effort to work. To. There's all kinds of challenges that arise, and I feel like, at least based on my own experience, the greatest challenge of all is finding ways to make the institution adapt to the fact that the community's aims and goals and priorities are not always exactly the same as the institutions, right, and, and it can be difficult, though, it can be done, it can be difficult to kind of mold and shape the institution to accommodate that. And I could tell terrible anecdotes, but I don't want to because it's too depressing. But um, after a cocktail one day when we're no longer in Zoom land, I'll tell you. But, but, um, and, and that, but of course that's of utmost importance. The last thing in the world you want to be doing is sort of saying, well, here's some research, here you go, right? Rather it's getting a sense iteratively. And so what I'm wondering is, I wonder if any, any or all of you would like to reflect a little bit on that. We've been talking about this and I'm thinking about it both in terms of the very specific communities that um, each of you engages with, the thing, especially of Ana Lu's work, but, but all of you, for, for us, um, some of us working here at the Institute for Advanced Study, it's been a partnership with the Muncie Delaware Nation working on some of their priorities around historical research and language revitalization. It's been wonderful. It's not directly, how can I put it? It doesn't feed directly into the stated priorities of the Book in the Silk Roads project, but it's been incredibly important for us in terms of our obligations that come on us just from living on this land. But also we've been learning ways of doing things that are enriching every part of our work and, and changing every part of our work. Um, anyway, so I guess what I'm asking for is, are, are, I wonder if 
um, and others may want to step in. I'm thinking maybe Felice might want to step in or Melissa or any of the panelists. Um, thinking about how the things we learn from what you've been sharing with us today, how these might begin to play out in other areas. And, and each of you may have already had that experience. Too. I know, David, for example, your responsibilities extend widely. Um, and each of you may, may already be thinking about these wider frameworks. Well, I, I want to say that, you know, I'm just looking forward to new opportunities to engage. Um, until now, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been centering local communities and meaning non-Indigenous communities or, or, you know, students of Latin American descent um, from various, um, you know, mestizo heritage, perhaps, that are, that have the opportunity, uh, in this case, for the first time at at an institution like the University of Toronto to engage in, in this kind of work uh, in a place like the Fisher. Uh, so my focus has been that until now, but I'm looking at events, for example, this fall um, in collaboration with um, you know, the Consul General of, of Mexico um, in, in finding ways to connect their collections with other communities and indigenous communities in ways that is relevant, in, in ways that is meaningful, right? And, and like I was saying earlier, in ways that we are teaching and learning uh, together. Uh, but uh, that is a challenge, uh, but a challenge that is also a responsibility um, that will just keep us quite occupied and excited to, to come to work and, and and know that the work that we're doing um, is, you know, touching people's lives. And, and, and is, you know, I love when the students come in and, and, and the students that have actually worked with this manuscript and written papers uh, on this manuscript, see themselves either reflected or, or, or captured uh, by the stories that are told uh, or that they discover on their own or, with the help of, you know, my help of the instructors when they open the pages of this book. So again, there are endless opportunities, but we have to be both strategic and, and, and always think about the meaning of those connections, how we can make them, you know, meaningful and, and yeah. I think it's, so, oh, sorry, so I was reminded oh. some of the comments Ana Lu was making a little bit earlier about the difficulty in, in making some of these institutional changes and it takes persistence and sometimes taking different pathways, but you were describing institutions ultimately accommodating themselves a little better to, to these priorities. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think like um, what I really like about this grant project that we're currently in the middle of is um, learning a lot, right, from the community, but also, also ways in how can we make institutional changes, right, to accommodate communities instead of um, thinking that the, the institution is the one that knows everything, right? Um, we have to take the lead of these communities and, and be okay with communities not wanting to work with institutions. Because sometimes that can happen too, and that's absolutely valid and okay. Not, not, the work doesn't always have to come from the institution. Um, and um, how can we as, as um, colonial institutions, right, with the power to implement changes, right, can, does that mean that we assist with building up tribal archives? Does that mean we work on helping um, um, pay for like uh, digital repatriations, make copies of stuff, facsimiles of stuff for communities? How can we do that? You know, it's, those are the types of things that I think about on, and it's been great working on this project and thinking through like for the urban communities here in Chicago, we're talking about a multi-tribal community, right? So there are no, um, in the state of Illinois, no, no uh, reservations, right? So you have a very diverse group of tribes here in Chicago. And how can, um, one of the things that the community mentioned was, um, how can we provide resources to the community from, the, from here, but also collaborate with different, different um, 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 not only institutions in Chicago, but communities too, to provide resources to uplift indigenous histories and really work towards recontextualizing what people here in Chicago think of when they think of Chicago as a, you know, indigenous people are, are erased or disappeared, right? Or they're, they're no longer here. How can we 
redo this history and really change that perspective that's seen here in the city and uplift Chicago as an indigenous place as it's always been and continues to be, right? So those are things that I often think about and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that I get to work in a place like this where I can also then in, on another level, like bring in, like what Debbie was saying, bring in um, individuals that, um, it's their first time coming into a special collection um, collection where they're able to see themselves within the collection, right? It's a very, um, it's very emotional when I first started seeing people come in and see like, oh my God, wow, like I didn't know this was here. Like I can see myself here and see material that's here, right? So yeah, that's my two cents to add to that. <laughs> Thank you. Phyllis and Melissa, did one or both of you want to comment a little or weigh in on some of these issues? I think it, yeah. I'm I'll just say quickly, I think it relates very much to what we talked about in the Ethiopian session and to some degree in the Judaica section session, whose objects are these? So, you know, as European and North American collecting institutions, from a dominant culture perspective, they're the ones controlling the, the narrative of how they're presented. And as Analu said, how they're cataloged so that and and i do see a connection between that kind of categorization and the library field and how i think that really did influence what happens in the museum space and i think the museum space has been much more flexible and fluid in rethinking how to recenter and it, it may be object by object creating a decolonized space i don't think you can do that in the museum the museum itself is a colonial institution but but how do we do that fluidly and creatively within these exhibitions through text and through um, digitization and is is um, how do how do people see themselves so one thing Aob does a lot is um, he shares the manuscript via social media and so that opens up a whole new audience of people who are connecting with with cultural heritage that may or may not be in London, may or may not ever go to the British Library or ever go to a museum. So how to connect with different audiences, I think it, it's, you know, finding creative ways of doing that. And I think it's a it's a multi platform and multi like pronged approach um, and and in, in, in bringing people into museums and libraries, as you all are saying, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to change how things are you know representation and that it's that it's not it's not a one-way interpretive stream of information anymore that has to change and so what what is that iterative thing and and getting back to just the bigger picture stuff of the local and global it's about being in relationship with the objects and who is in relationship with them and how are they in relationship with one another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's happening in the global, you know, the global Middle Ages, you know, scholarship that's happening now too. I think it's doing that. That's why you mentioned Instagram, but he shared it on they shared it on Instagram because I just quoted literally for this high school class that I'm on TikTok and I post on TikTok. <laughs> and I just told them, you know, that I that I'm like, I'm trying to keep up with what you youth are doing. And there's an indigenous, I say it jokingly because I learn a lot of stuff on there too, but also, there's some ways of teaching um, Indigenous um, librarian First Nations that I'm a fan of. Her name is uh, Jessie Lawyer, and she has a TikTok where she was teaching Indigenous librarianship, and she also posts these little, like, three-minute videos to really contextualize these huge theoretical things into a three-minute teaching moment, and I really love that approach. Um, but I also wanted to agree with um, Elena, where she said it takes courage uh, to take a risk it's not that difficult I would agree um, with with the with also mentioning too that it takes the courage um, we're in a hierarchy when we're in institutions it takes the courage from administration and presidents of libraries directors of libraries too because at a hierarchic hierarchy level when librarian such as myself I can make these suggestions and such but then it has to go up the chain of command but it definitely does take a risk that that we can make these suggestions to happen and I hope that they do that you know Yes, definitely. Offers a pilot, which we're doing. Yeah. And, and those resources that I sent over, um, I'll link you to a couple of series of pilots that we're doing as far um, as far as like um, in, implementing traditional knowledge labels within our catalog records. Um, I can't say enough about our catalogers and the stuff that they're doing. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Illinois Indigenous Peoples Treaty. It's another really good one. Yeah. Denise, were you going to comment? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I just want to point out uh, from the perspective of a curator of Aga Khan Museum, you may wonder why this manuscript is displayed uh, within this exhibition uh, at the Aga Khan Museum. As you know, uh, the nature of our collection is Islamic art and then how we see in context of this, uh, how we can uh, justify the, uh, the display, uh, display of a Mexican baptismal register. And when we, uh, you know, our en uh, encouragement comes from a BSR research group. And on the other hand, uh, when we start to create uh, the concept of the exhibition, we were very much relying on, on the research perspective and re results of the research of PSR. And this specific manuscript was one of their focal point. And, but is it enough to justify to display at Aga Khan Museum uh, with the topic of uh, books along the Silk Roads? And uh, it was very interesting because we have started our conversation from uh, the view, uh, 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 by viewing the uh, book binding of this manuscript and the flap. And uh, I was so fascinated um, the, um, by the work ethic uh, of our collaboration and uh, Melissa and Susanna and Jessica Lockhart also, the core, um, core team, uh, including uh, Alexandra Boliteno. Um, we were discussing, is it enough justification for us to display this uh, manuscript for sake of book binding and uh, inspiration uh, probably coming from Islamic uh, book binding tradition. And then when uh, BSR revealed more and more uh, the research about this manuscript and the meaning of this manuscript, we literally, <laughs> it was eye opening and we said, collectively, we can't just display for sake of bookbinding, it has to have its own space, own aura within the exhibition, and we can discuss it in, in uh, as uh, exclusive as possible, but in connection with the other manuscripts and uh, laying out the tradition. And uh, for in first place, it looked like an impossible task, but uh, having Dave, um, David in conversation, constant conversation with Suzanne and having other experts uh, in conversation uh, who guided us uh, for a meaningful display uh, at the Aga Khan Museum was uh, phenomenal. And I can only say from the visitor's uh, experience, it, everyone understands the meaning of this uh, manuscript, why it is in the exhibition related to books along the Silk Roads. On the other hand, I will take you a little bit uh, uh, back uh, early October. Uh, Jessica uh, would remember we were installing the <laughs> exhibition during the celebration of re uh, reconciliation. And we were hosting indigenous artists in the, in the permanent gallery of Aga Khan Museum. And in the second floor, we were installing Poti style uh, manuscript Kamawasa, which was the, uh, which were the topic of the uh, yesterday's conversation discussions. And all was happening in the same time. And then I agree with David, you know, we all witness uh, experience uh, in our profession, uh, what we are doing with these manuscripts, but, but during the installation and during the exhibition, uh, um, we had also created very personal relationship to the artworks. And um, I was uh, blessed to give uh, in, uh, virtual lectures about the exhibition to many colleges, not only from Canada. And it was very interesting. And uh, first, I couldn't, I hesitate to include this manuscript because uh, I admire uh, the openness of Timothy uh, for the Ethiopian um, panel discussion. He said, by no means, he is the expert. I would say the same of me. I don't feel comfortable to talk about this manuscript uh, rather than acknowledging the meaning of, of it. And uh, it was very interesting for me, but then I was more and more encouraged by the students and they thanked me to include into my presentation because they were saying, uh, most, some of them are coming from Mexico and they say, we are not offended by your presentation. We are 
happy for your acknowledgement. I leave it there. Thank you for sharing that, Therese. I'm thinking about the ways in which we ended up positioning this object at the at the sort of very end, you know, the last um, section of the exhibition is the intercultural interfaith crossroads and that area is doing a certain kind of work. And then this book is not paired by itself in a case um, so that it's the last thing that a visitor encounters before they go out back into the world, back out into Toronto. And the QR code on the case connects them to um, uh, an opportunity to hear David talk a little bit about the volume. And, you know, I feel like, you know, nothing, nothing is perfect in what we did, but I feel like that, that I'm happy that, that you were getting those responses from sharing um, and acknowledging the presence of that object there. I, I feel like that was a good thing. Thank you for sharing that. It means a lot. Thank you, absolutely. And um, what po uh, Susanna pointed out is also very significant because this manuscript is at the end of the exhibition, but somehow closer to Indian uh, Kashmiri manuscript, but also close to um, Singxiang carpet. So when, when we accept Singxiang as uh, the birth lo location of Silk Road, our thinking was also where this, contemporary Silk Road ends uh, and uh, how we can create these relationships and connections. And, uh, you know, you may know wh where you start, but uh, the journey and the destination is uh, uh, unknown until you arrive there. And that was also the beauty. And I, I thank for encouragement uh, through BSR team and uh, also how we work together. I want to just mention as Aga Khan Museum, which is built upon a mission of uh, spreading and explaining and uh, practicing pluralism. And that was very meaningful for us to have this exhibition. And on the other hand, since we opened the museum 2014, uh, we are regularly uh, holding ceremonies for new citizens, uh, citizenship ceremonies in collaboration with the Canadian and Ontarian go um, federal government. So it's also very meaningful in that regard, introducing this uh, uh, diverse uh, cultures, uh, different ideas uh, um, under the ceiling, ceiling of Aga Khan Museum. And uh, you met the, my colleague Amirali Alipai, head of uh, performance art. And since we began, uh, actually uh, the inauguration of the museum was uh, um, presented by indigenous artists. And since then, Amirali is always including uh, the performance artist uh, from diaspora, but also from, from indigenous community, uh, communities. And he is much more uh, experienced uh, working with communities in performance art. And uh, it was my first test how I can bleed in into our collection and uh, merge with our presentations display and how we can look at the art from the global perspective and see the uni uh, how unified us and how we can create connections that we can build upon it. Thank you there for that please. Um, yeah I'm, I'm thinking about um, emotions you know how 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 the museum is a space that invites us to acknowledge the emotions that are arise when uh, that, that, that arise when the object and the human being in, or come, come into contact. I'm thinking about not only the way it was so moving after having worked on the exhibition remotely for a long time, how moving it was to come into the gallery and, and be with the objects before we opened the exhibition, but then how, I don't know, three times as much moving it was then to come in again with people there. And, you know, that's so different from the uh, the space of the research university where we are often encouraged to sort of strip away that affective part of the work we do. I mean, it's always there, right? But we're encouraged, I think, to deny it or hide it or conceal it. And, and one of the things I, I wanna take away from this conversation and keep thinking about is, you know, what is the role? I, 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 how, how do we continue to work along a path that emphasizes collaboration and relationship more than individual I don't know, the individual genius who works on something. How do we allow for space for acknowledgement of the emotions and the that that whole level of knowing, that whole kind of affective knowing, as well as 
what the university um, and other research environments encourage us to do. And as I feel like there are implications that come out for not just what we could call methodology, but just what we think we're doing in these spaces when we inhabit these spaces, whether it's the rare book library, whether it's the um, um, a, a research library, whether it's the university, whether it's the museum. I feel like that we have a lot to, to keep thinking about here. Thank you so much again, David, Dominique, and Ana Lu. Yeah. Um, and Thank, you. Thank you, Melissa, so much. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa.